In my opinion, Immanuel Kant is one of the greatest and most important of philosophers. His critique of pure reason is quite difficult to read, but it's one of the most profound and important books that I have ever read. In this series of videos, I'll give you some of the basics so you can better understand his critique of pure reason. Let's start with the famous spectacle or glasses metaphor. Imagine every human being, including yourself, is born with green spectacles on and that there is no way to take these spectacles off. They are part of your brain, your apparatus, by which you not only view the world, but constitute it. So you perceive everything as green and you are not capable of perceiving anything as not green because your brain colors all as green. Notice too that you think the greenness must be out there in the world because you learn all things must be green from your experience of the world. However, if you believe this, you would be mistaken. You would be mistaken if you believe greenness comes from empirical experience because the greenness comes from the spectacles, the lenses, not the world. Now let's move away from the metaphor and get into Kant. In a similar way, Kant argued that your experience of space, time, causation, mathematics, and a few other ways of thinking and intuiting come from the spectacles, not the physical world. Your knowledge of space and time may arise with experience, but it's not ultimately from experience. So you might be thinking, well, this is really interesting theory, but how does Kant prove that space and time and so on are in the spectacles? And this is where it really gets interesting. Much of his book, The Critique, is just that. It's a proof using epistemology to prove that space and time and so on must be in the spectacles, not from the world. Kant will use different types of knowledge claims that we make to show that some of these knowledge claims have properties that cannot come from experience or mere thinking. They must come from the spectacles. So in later videos in this series, I'll explain that in more detail, but for now, just keep in mind the spectacle metaphor. Before concluding, let me clarify a couple other points. Notice that space and time, this spectacle metaphor, it's not committed to the idea that space and time are not real. This is because according to the metaphor, we cannot know reality in itself. Reality in itself is what Kant calls the noumenal world. We can only know reality as we constitute it through the spectacles, what Kant calls the phenomenal world. That is, we cannot take off our spectacles to see if space and time are really out there. Okay, we can never transcend our spectacles. So science, math, religion, and other claims of knowledge are destroyed by Kant and his system. These things work, but they aren't real or ultimate knowledge. Kant has divided reality in two, the unknowable noumenal world and the knowable world, that is the phenomenal world, that we perceive through our spectacles. So the world of science, logic, math, and experience, that's the phenomenal world. Now Kant calls this spectacle view his Copernican revolution. He says that, quote, Hitherto it has been assumed that all our knowledge must conform to objects. But Kant believes we will make better progress when we suppose and then prove that objects conform to the mind. Just as Copernicus tried to show the sun does not go around the earth, but vice versa, so Kant will show that your knowledge doesn't have to conform to reality. Rather, objects conform to the mind as well. That is, the mind is not a blank slate. It's active, not passive. And we can discover how it is active, not by looking out at the world, like mathematicians, scientists, and many philosophers do, but only by examining the lenses, the spectacles themselves. And as we shall see later, this will be accomplished, accomplished through epistemology. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, hasn't science answered these questions? So, for example, hasn't Einstein corrected Kant's view of space and time? And the short answer is no. The Newtonian view of space is not necessary for the Kantian view. This is a common misunderstanding even among some scholars. Also, Einstein and other scientists, they do not address this because what Kant is exploring is what is presupposed for any experience of space at all, whereas Einstein and modern physicists are exploring the empirical properties of space. Einstein is doing science. Kant is exploring what is presupposed for any science at all. The first step of science is observation, and this presupposes certain categories by which to observe. Kant is seeking ultimate truth. Science is seeking empirical truths and what works. I should also add that Kant will never be as famous as these scientists because most of us are struggling to survive and we want what works. We want toasters and nuclear weapons, not ultimate truths or arguments about the unknowability of ultimate truth. However, there are moments when we do want that kind of deeper knowledge, and this is when Kant becomes interesting. Whatever the case, Kant is difficult to understand, but the effort is well worth it. Please see the next three videos in this series. Thank you.